All right, good evening, everybody. Let's stand and sing number 240 as we get started. Number 240, we're going to sing the Lily of the Valley to get started. Number 240, we're going to sing all three verses. Sing with me, 240. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me or yet forsake me here while I live my faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing not to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roam. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for the good singing. Welcome uh, to Wednesday night. Let's open up in a word of prayer this evening. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I do thank you for all of your blessings, Lord, and your watch care over us. I thank you for, Lord, uh, those who are able to be here tonight. Lord, I do know that we have several that are sick and uh, feeling uh, under the weather, and I do pray that you'd bless them, um, and I pray that you would help them and return them to us, Lord, as soon as, as soon as they're healthy. And Father, I do pray that you'd just bless our church, uh, bless the services tonight, bless the preaching as Brother Barker preaches tonight, and uh, Lord, just be with us. Uh, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. And we have a letter, too. Okay. All right. Let's sing number 146. Number 146. Uh, shelter in the time of storm. Sing with me. Number 146. The Lord's our rock. In him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. 
We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, rock divine, O oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. I'm starting to think Max is a Benedict Arnold. He's leaving me here on Wednesdays so I can do the announcements for him. Anyway, uh, so tonight's verse is Philippians 4, 6. I'm going to say that once this evening, and then we'll... I'll go over it, and then I'll just move on to the announcements. So, uh, Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. Well, so, I'll say that verse together this evening. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. Alrighty, and for announcements this, uh, announcements this evening, uh, we do not have game night. That was last Sunday. So I crossed that off. And now, uh, ladies' meeting, we are going to have that. That's Actually, that's to be continued um, since my mom's uh, back surgery. And, uh, and uh, if you have not signed up for the fall frenzy, that's up in the four years. That's October 14th and the 15th. Uh, we're going to meet here at 930 at the church. And then finally, we're going to have the McCracken Christmas. Uh, that's the uh, revival services with Brother Dave McCracken. All right. Tonight, we have a prayer letter from the Schrope family. There are missionaries to the country of Australia. Uh, they write, Dear Pastor Baxter and Naples Baptist Temple, Greetings once again from Australia. I pray, that, I pray this letter finds each of you doing well. June and July have been very busy months for us. As many of you uh, know, I, tort, I had torn a meniscus and was scheduled to have knee surgery back in April, but it got canceled due to COVID lockdowns. Thankfully, it was able to be rescheduled for June 9th, and it wasn't canceled a second time. The surgery went well, although it was a lot worse than what the MRI had shown. It was originally going to be a 30-minute repair with a short two- to three-week recovery, but when the surgeon got into surgery, he discovered that the meniscus was not just torn, it had ripped all the way through and detached. The short surgery and fast recovery quickly turned into an over an hour and a half long surgery and a three- to six-month recovery, with me being on crutches and in a knee brace for the past six weeks. Thankfully, there were no other complications, and as I write this letter, I have officially completed my six weeks, which means I am off the crutches and no longer have to wear the knee brace. I'm still taking therapy and need to be careful over the next several months, but overall, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, in July, we had our, an annual a family camp hosted by Pastor Carr and Bayview Baptist Church in Busselton. I was only two and a half weeks out of surgery at the time, so this year's camp was a little more challenging. However, I, was, I had a mobile scooter to get, help me get around the campgrounds, and the weather was pretty good for being winter, so it wasn't too bad. The theme was a double-minded man, uh, and the preaching was spot on and challenging. It was good to catch up with the folks from, uh, from other churches of like faith and just to get away from the world for a week. Uh, the next big event on our calendar is our annual youth conference held in September. We're already starting to make plans, practice skits, and do all the necessary planning to host around 120 people. Our theme this year is free indeed, uh, taken from John 8:36. If if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Uh, we look forward to what God will do in the uh, meeting and are already praying and asking Him to work in hearts. 
The last couple of months have been quiet when it comes to visitors at church, but we continue to invite people as we pray and ask God to send more souls our way. Uh, we are currently in the process of trying to get a, a tract on every door in, a, in, in Augusta. I almost said Australia. That would be quite the feat. Uh, on every door in Augusta, uh, as well as starting uh, to letterbox uh, Margaret River again. We had a couple of Sundays when we couldn't meet in our building due to some remodel and repairs, but we were back in the hall, and it looks very nice. On a different note, our family found out some exciting news last month. My little brother, Danny, is coming over in August for a three-month visit. Years ago, when I was still in high school, my parents got involved in foster care. My parents have adopted five children through the foster care program, and Danny is one of them. Uh, Danny just turned 19 this year and is seeking God's will for his life. Uh, he has a burden for missions and wanted to come over and spend a few months helping us, which will be a real blessing. Health-wise, our family is doing well. Winter is on its way out, and spring is just around the corner for us. I'm, uh, I, for one, am looking forward to the warmer weather. Uh, thank you for your faithful giving and prayers for the work here in Australia. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Uh, please continue to pray for God to send forth more laborers into the harvest here, uh, here and for God to give us liberty as we share the gospel. Your servants in Christ, Brother Butch Schroep. Um, Brother Bill, would you please uh, pray for the Shrope family in Australia? Uh, Shrope. Shrope. Mm-hmm. Amen. All right. Um, so just a little report before Brother Barker comes to preach uh, and also other prayer requests. We want to make sure to take those so we can pray for one another. But um, just a little report on Karis. Um, the, uh, you know, many of you knew that she had had some back pain. She'd actually... Uh, been living with, per, I think, progressively worsening pain uh, for about the last nine months. So uh, it's been very, it's been a struggle for her, and she's put a brave face on. But she's um, many times you see her having to leave the services. It's literally because she can't sit. She that basically it, sitting is has been a terrible thing, a uh, struggle for her over over these months. But uh, so. We had to, you know, finally, after they did all they could with injections, they finally scheduled the surgery. Of course, the surgeon took off the entire month of July or whatever it was. You know, he went on vacation. Um, and uh, so we got, got delayed until we finally had a surgery date on the 23rd, which was yesterday. Um, and so we got there. The surgeon said it was actually worse than the MRI, actually, from a couple of months ago. It had actually even gotten worse. He said there was a lot of pressure. It had even impinged even and further upon the nerves and the way he described it to me. But he said it was a very easy surgery. It was very straightforward. Uh, he said it was able to fix everything um, and in ways that I don't fully understand, and nor do I want to. The surgery would have not, never have been the occupation for me. I'm not squeamish, but that's not interesting at all to me. Um, but. Um, the bad thing was, though, and I was sitting there in the waiting room. They won't let you come back to the post office area. Uh, you know, there's not supposed to be visitors back there. And I was sitting there waiting for them to come get me. And it just waited, and I waited, and I waited. And I finally went and asked. They said, no, they're still doing some things, and I waited. And then finally she starts texting me. They're not telling me anything. She texts me and says that she's uh, still struggling, basically. I finally get back there, and she says that she's actually, when she woke up, she actually had you know, double the pain as to when she had before the surgery. I mean, she was just in outlandish pain. 
but after a couple of hours and some additional medicines and, and basically painkillers and, and steroids and things like that, they got that nerve to settle down. And the only thing I can describe it as, this may or may not be accurate, is you know when your foot goes to sleep, it, work, it hurts worse when it wakes up. So that nerve had been essentially cut off for months. And when they were feeling, when it was free again, it just went a little crazy. Today, she's been resting easily. She's gotten up several times. They wanted her to walk for about 30 minutes today. She has been able to. Um, she has no pain, a little bit of numbness. Uh, the incision, you know, is actually where she's only, the only pain she's had, I think, is really in that incision area, which was natural. Um, but uh, I just thank everybody for their prayers. Um, it was a uh, very stressful day, most of the day yesterday, but uh, just thank you for your prayers. And I just, I'm very hopeful that the Lord is just going to continue to bless this, uh, the operation that was done, and she's just going to have a, a full recovery. About two weeks is what the doctor said for a surgery recovery, about two months for a complete functional recovery, and about six months to a complete recovery so that everything is healed. So she's basically on light duty for at least two months. So that's, I just spilled my thimble of knowledge, so that's what I know. <laughs> so anyway, um, other prayer requests. I, I, do, I do thank you for your prayers for our other prayer requests tonight. Your mom and dad are moving. Pray for the Mallards. They are loading a U-Haul, which is always fun. Leaving tomorrow. Leaving tomorrow. So they're getting right on the field, right down there in Poplar Bluff. When I was a little kid, I thought it was Popular Bluff, but it's not. It's Poplar Bluff. Other prayer requests tonight. Um, do pray for those that are sick. We've got a couple of families that are sick, uh, have some sickness going around, so just pray for them. Um, and as always, pray for our missionaries. All right. Um, any other prayer requests? Pray for Taylor whenever you think about it. You've got how many? Two months? Yeah. Getting close. Two months. Um, so pray for that. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then, Brother Barker, you come preach. Father, thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you for keeping us safe, Lord. And I do pray that you would help those that are not feeling well feel better. Thank you for Karis' surgery and, Lord, the way that all worked out. And, Father, I do pray that you'd bless us tonight. Bless us in the preaching. Uh, bless us, Lord. Help us as we uh, look into your word. And, Lord, help us be edified um, by your Holy Spirit tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Brother Barker, come preach. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that the surgery went well and now she can kind of rest up and recover and take bank glad that's behind you now, you know. All right. We're going to look at a lot of different scriptures tonight, but we'll start off with uh, Psalm 119 and verse 89. Psalm 119. Just kind of start off with that and then move around a little bit. Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Is it good to know? Amen. No matter what happens in this crazy, mixed up world we're living in, God's word is settled in heaven. Right. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here tonight. Uh, for the midweek service. Give us good meat and help me as I preach. I pray the Holy Spirit will give me the right words to say. May the Holy Spirit fill me and direct my thoughts. Keep your hand on this congregation tonight. Keep your hand on Sister Karis as she's back home recovering. Keep your hand on the pastor as he uh, leads the flock. And again, give us a good meeting tonight. We've been blessed already so far. And I pray for you continued hand of blessing upon us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I want to speak tonight about the superiority of the King James Bible. The superiority of the King James Bible. The King James Version was authorized by King James I. That's why it's called the Authorized Version. He authorized it. Uh, he was the King of Great Britain. The first English translation of the Bible was done years earlier by John Wycliffe. He published the New Testament in 1380. Because back then, nobody had access to the Bible. 
and the Roman Catholic Church was not allowing people to look at the Bible. They had no English translation. All they had was in Latin, and nobody spoke Latin. So Wycliffe translated the New Testament in 1380 and the Old Testament two years later. The Roman Catholic Church condemned John Wycliffe. They didn't want the people to read the Bible. They wanted to keep him in ignorance and superstition and so on. So they condemned him for translating the Bible into English. And they showed their contempt by digging up his bones and burning them nearly 44 years after his death. Think about that. Later on came the Tyndale New Testament. William Tyndale translated his New Testament in 1525. So we're getting closer to King James Version with 1611. 1525 was the Tyndale New Testament. His Old Testament came a little bit later. It's been said, and I think this is pretty accurate, it's been said that about 90% of our King James Version was taken from William Tyndale's Version. So if you look at Tyndale's Version, you can find it on the internet. Uh, you can find almost anything on the internet, good or bad, but you can find it. It's very remarkably close to the King James. They really followed it pretty closely. There's some changes. Like I said, about 10% is different, but 90% is the same as Tyndale. By the way, Tyndale was ordained a Roman Catholic priest, but he got saved, yeah. and he boldly renounced the Roman Catholic Church, and he renounced the, their false teachings and their false doctrines. He called the Pope Antichrist. Well, guess what happened to him? He was burned at the stake. Yeah, yeah that's the way they treated people like that. He was burned at the stake in 1536. Roman Catholics also burned John Rogers, who was a translator of the Matthews Bible. That was another Bible that came along before the King James Version. Now, let's, that's a little bit of background. Let's get to the King James Version now. The King James Bible has repeatedly been referred to as the noblest monument of English prose. And I think that's true. That's not an exaggeration to say it is the noblest monument of English prose. Here's a quote from a preacher. He's in heaven now, Ian Paisley. I had the privilege of hearing him preach quite a few times, and I knew him. Not very well, but I met him a couple of times. But anyway, Paisley said this. The language of the King James Version is terse and reverent and is in timeless English that a child can read, learn, and understand. Its very rhythm has led to sanctity of thought, holy awe, and a worshipful approach to God. It is equally suitable to both private and public reading. It is, in my opinion, the best translation. We cannot and will not exchange it for an inferior version. Amen. Its excellence, its faithfulness, its power, and there is power in the King James Bible, by the way. Those other versions just don't cut it. But anyway... Its excellence, its faithfulness, its power, and its witfulness have been proved in our own hearts and in the hearts of millions more. Uh, it's been said that the King James Bible, along with the writings of William Shakespeare, played an important role in the formation of our English language. Uh, the King James Bible is credited as responsible for dozens of popular phrases. In other words, people will say these phrases without even realizing they come from the King James Bible. I'll just throw out a few. How are the mighty fallen? Yeah. The love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, it's not money is the root of all evil. Right. If you think that, you can give me, I'll take it off your hand. Just give me some and I'll, I'll, uh, I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll give it to missions, amen? Yeah. But if you think money is evil, I'll take it off your hand. But it's the love of money is the root of all evil. And all is vanity. Uh, I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. And whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Just, just a few. There's so many more uh, that are so well known today. They come from the English, King James English Version. All right, let me start out by saying that God has preserved his word. The Bible, the King James Bible is inspired and it's preserved. And there's a difference between inspiration and preservation. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. Lord willing, we'll look at a few verses tonight in this uh, message on the superiority of the King, King James Version. But go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Notice that. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, that word inspiration here in verse 16 means literally God breathed. It's exactly what it means, God breathed. The King James Bible is inspired. God breathed it out, you see? It means God himself gave these words to us. Right. See? That's inspiration, not preservation. I'll get to preservation in a minute. That's inspiration. There's a, there's a difference. We ought to recognize that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Think about that. The Holy Spirit moved them as they were writing down the words. And when I say these holy men of God, these men that were moved by the Holy Ghost, we're talking about Moses, David, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, Peter. These holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The word moved in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 means these holy men of God whom God chose to write scripture were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see, they used their own vocabulary, but everything that was put there, God wanted in there. That's right. And nothing was put in there that God didn't want put in there. That's, right. that's, that's so important to understand that. They were not communicating their own ideas. You know, I'll, I'll hear people say, well, you know, the, Paul said, you know, a woman shouldn't preach. Well, that's just Paul's, I, Paul was old fashioned. You know, Paul was a male chauvinist. No, that wasn't Paul's own uh, opinions or views. That's the word of God. Amen. Paul wasn't writing down his own ideas. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, you see? Those weren't Paul's own opinions. And I can give you other examples too. You know, you quote scripture. Well, that's just what he thought. No, that's the word of God, you see. They were not communicating their own ideas, their own opinions, but the very words that God gave them. They were human penmen, but God himself was the divine author. Right. Now, let's get to preservation. That's inspiration. There's a difference. Preserve means the act of preserving, protecting, and keeping safe. This means the word of God has been protected from corruption or destruction. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, ah, oh, the Bible's so old, it's been changed, it's been, it's been corrupted. No, no, it hasn't. God's preserved it. Amen. Listen, if God can create the sun, the moon, the stars, this world, don't you think he can, he can preserve, preserve his word? I mean, don't you think God's able to do that? He promised he would do it, and he did it. Look at Psalm 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. And this is an important, this is an important discussion because I, I can tell you right now, a lot of people, if you were to ask them which Bible to use, they'll say King James. Why? Well, I don't know. My church uses it. That all? Well, my pastor likes it. You ought to be able to say, our music is the best translation, it's the most accurate translation, it's the most trustworthy translation. All other translations are inferior to the King James. And there's never going to be a new translation to be, that's going to improve upon the King James. We ought to be able to say that without just saying, well, I, I don't know why I use it. Let me go ask my pastor. That's not good enough. You ought to know why we stand on the King James. And there's another thing. Some people make foolish comments regarding the King James. Let's just stick to what is real, not that's some silly stuff. I'll give you an example. I was preaching many years ago uh, at Ambassador Baptist Bible College in Lattimore, North Carolina. And I was talking to one of the professors. That, by the way, it's a good King James-only school. And I, I know Brother Comfort. He's preached for me a couple, few times in my church. So anyway, I was preaching. I was talking to one of the professors, and I said, I'm glad you take a good stand on the King James Bible. He said, Brother Barker, we are King James only, but we're not King James ugly. I like that. Some people are King James ugly. You know, oh, you use a different Bible? You're probably not even saved. You know, you're, you're an apostate. Come on, man. there are some nice people who use different versions. We've got to help them and teach them. Don't insult them and, and, and be mean to them, amen? Right. You're not going to win them over that way. There are some good Christian people who use different versions. They, just, they don't know any better. Maybe that's, somebody gave them that Bible, and they, it's all they know. They, the church they go to, they use that Bible. We're going to try to persuade them that the King James is better, not by being mean to them, amen? amen. Let's be King James only, but not King James ugly, amen? Yeah. All right, God's preserved his word. Psalm 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, 
purified seven times. Now watch this, verse 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Keep what? The words of the Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. For how long? Forever. God's word is preserved forever. Hey, the Lord Jesus spoke about this. Jesus said this. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 35. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Right. They're preserved. Not going to pass away. Okay? So inspiration, there's a distinction, there's a difference between inspiration and preservation, but they go together. You really can't have one without the other. They're in, inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. And I, and I tell you why I say that. I've heard people say, well, the king, you know, here's what I say. The Bible is uh, inspired in the original languages, but it hasn't been preserved. What good is inspiration without preservation? We, you know, we don't have the original manuscripts. We need a version that's, that we can trust and rely on. If the King James Bible is not preserved, what good is, say, the Bible's inspired in the original autographs, in the original languages? That doesn't make any sense. We need a trustworthy version that we can have and, and read and understand and learn from and memorize and so on and preach from it, and that's the King James Version, Amen. you see? Now, there's other important terms besides inspiration and uh, preservation. Uh, infallibility, the Bible's infallible. Inerrancy, the Bible's inerrant, no mistakes. There's no mistakes in the Bible. I've heard people say, oh, <laughs> the Bible's got so many mistakes. <laughs> I said, well, just tell me one. Well, there's so many. I said, well, just give me one. I don't know they're in there. Yeah. <laughs> they can't even name one. Now, once in a while, somebody will tell me, well, and they'll come up with something. It's not a mistake. It can be easily explained. It's not a mistake, you know? But people think they, uh, they've heard that and they repeat that. The Bible's got mistakes in it. I'm here to tell you tonight, there are no mistakes in our King James Bible. Yeah. You can trust the King James Bible. No mistakes in it, you see? So the Bible's without error. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's totally trustworthy. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't go along with that when I hear preachers say, well, I believe the Bible's inerrant, but uh, I don't believe God's preserved his word. And the original manuscripts are inspired, but now we have so many translations, that's good enough for me. Well, that's not good enough for me because these various translations contradict each other. You get a cut, here's the NIV, here's the RSV, here's, a, you know, Mickey Mouse, and you compare them, they disagree with each other, they contradict each other. So stick with the King James Version, amen? The problem is these new translations are not trustworthy, and they contradict each other. 1 Corinthians 14, says, God is not the author of confusion, amen? Now, you may recall that wicked King Je Jehoiakim uh, thought he can get rid of the Word of God, and he cut it up and threw it in the fire. Remember that story? It's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36. He cut it up and threw it in the fire. Stories in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 36, verse 27. Jeremiah 36, verse 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king, that's that wicked uh, King Jehoiakim, he was a bad king, after the king had burned the roll, the roll refers to the word of God. Back in those days, we didn't have books like we have now, the rolls. See, it's on a roll, you open the roll, and that, that's how they had the Bible. So he took the roll and he threw it in the fire. So after he burned the roll, and the words which Baruch, that was the one who wrote down the words for Jeremiah, his penman, you could say like his secretary, Anyway, which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying in verse 28, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. What am I trying to say? You can't destroy God's word. God has preserved his word. By the way, I mentioned the Catholic Church. During the Dark Ages, they were burning Bibles. But you can't stamp out the word of God. They burned, they burned Bibles, and they burned Bible translators, like I mentioned, Wycliffe and so on, and Tind I mean, Tyndale. All right, now, some say God has preserved the ideas and thoughts 
and doctrines of Scripture, but not the exact words. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I've heard that a few times. Well, the, the ideas are preserved, the, the general idea and the thoughts, and even some of the doctrines are preserved, but not the exact words. They're not preserved. Now, I don't go along with that. Every single word is preserved. Amen. Every single word. Again, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He didn't say, but the general idea shall not pass away, or the doctrine shall not pass away. The words, my words shall not pass away. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verse 13 refers to the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. Which things also we speak, not of the words which man's wisdom teacheth, now watch this, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Talking about scripture. The Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, Interesting, interesting comment here in the Schofield Bible. The Schofield Bible says the writers of Scripture invariably affirm where the subject is mentioned by them at all that the words of their writings are divinely taught. The words are divinely taught. The very words. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, verse 18. Jesus said, Reverently I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So not only are the very words preserved, even the jots and tittles are preserved. A jot is like the smallest letter in the alphabet, all right? A tittle refers to a small stroke or a point uh, in writing, like an accent over a letter or, or a dot over the letter I. That's what we're talking about. Even those little dots are preserved, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18. So the King James Version is the preserved word of God. The new translations are missing many words. Sometimes whole sentences are taken out. A whole sentence is gone. Uh, entire verses, just they're gone. The modern translations not only contradict the King James Version, but they contradict each other. Therefore, they cannot be the preserved, trustworthy, accurate Word of God. They cannot be. Let me give you some examples. Acts 8.37. number of times over the years I've had people tell me, you know, preacher, you... you uh, only use the King James. Why is that? How come you don't like the new versions? And this is one of the verses I'll, I'll show them. Go to Acts 8. I know you're familiar with this. I think Pastor Baxter preached on it recently. Acts chapter 8, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch. He was a man of great authority. He was sort of like the treasurer for the queen, Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Came all the way to Jerusalem to worship. He was heading back home, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Verse 29 says, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Verse 30, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read. He heard him read. That means the eunuch must have been reading out loud because Philip heard him, heard him read. And he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. In other words, I need someone to explain it to me. And that's exactly what Philip did. So Philip uh, explained to him that Isaiah chapter 53 was talking about Jesus. You see, look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, verse 36, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water. By the way, if they both went down into the water, you better believe Philip was going to baptize him by immersion. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, why did they both go down into the water for? If you're going to sprinkle him, you could have, Philip could have stayed right there by the water and just grabbed a handful of water and sprinkled on his head. They both went down into the water so Philip can get... So Philip can baptize them the right way, the proper way, by immersion. Amen? And it was believer's baptism because the eunuch believed. He said, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see? 
And by the way, verse 39 says, when they would come up out of the water. Come up out of the water means he was fully immersed. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what I'm getting at. Verse 37 is missing in the modern translations. It's just not even there. In modern translations, it goes from verse 36 right to verse 38. 37 is just not even there. I mean, that story is, is, doesn't make sense if that verse is just torn out like that. Here's how it reads in the modern versions. See, here's water. What well, thought tell me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and he baptized. Wait a minute. He didn't answer his question. Philip didn't answer the eunuch's question. And not only that, but the eunuch didn't make any profession of faith. He's baptized without a profession of faith. That verse belongs there. To, to take that verse out is wrong. Amen. And every single person I've showed that to, I could see the countenance change. And I said, oh, I, I never noticed that before. I, I didn't know that. And I had a new convert to the King James Version. Amen? Now, here's another one. 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What does that mean? Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. All right? He, 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 that, that affirms his deity, his incarnation. But you know what it says in the modern versions? He, he had a body. Well, he was manifest in the flesh. That doesn't prove anything. I have a body. I'm manifest in the flesh. So are you. But when you say God was manifest in the flesh, you're saying Jesus Christ is God. But the modern versions take out that word God. I can give other examples, but I'm looking at the clock, so I want to keep moving along here. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, say every word of God is pure. Every word. Notice that? Not just some of the words. Every word. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. We're not supposed to add anything to the Bible. But the modern versions take, add things and take things away. It's wrong to add to God's word. If anything is added, it can't be pure. But the Bible says every word of God is pure. You see? And it can't be preserved. If people are adding things and taking things away. It can't be preserved, you see. Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. In other words, don't take anything away from it. Deuteronomy 4, 2, don't diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And I think the strongest warning is found in the very last chapter of the Bible, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Chapter 22. And I remember a long time ago, the first time I saw this, I had already made up my mind I was going to be a King James Bible preacher and stick with the King James. But when I saw this, it just kind of confirmed it in my heart. Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away, like we just saw in Acts 8, 37, if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city, that's the new Jerusalem, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, the devil knows the Bible. The devil knows scripture. And you may recall he quoted scripture uh, when he tempted our Lord. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. And our Lord responded to the devil by quoting scripture. And Jesus said this, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. Every word. Isaiah 40, verse 8, says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. God's word shall stand forever. It's preserved. Amen. Can't take away from it. You can't add to it. It's the preserved word of God. Now, let me say this before we go home tonight. The modern versions have been corrupted. They've been, they're polluted. They've been corrupted. The new English translations are not reliable. They're not trustworthy. I already mentioned how Acts 8.37 has been taken out of the modern versions. Here's some more examples. Matthew 17, verse 21 says, How be it this kind 
goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. But this verse is missing from the NIV and most of the other New Bibles. It's not there. Just the whole verse is gone. So here's, here's, a, here's a very important verse. Now our church, when I was pastoring, we had a regular time of fasting, at least one day a week. We, our church owed money on a bond program. We met at mine. We're going to keep fasting. And many members are fasting. And we use verses like this. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. But yet that verse is missing in you know, modern Bibles. It's removed. In the King James, here's another example. In the King James Version, we see many instances where men worship the Lord Jesus. But several of these references to worship have been removed from the New Bible versions. I'll give you some examples. Matthew 8, 2. Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. Right? But the NIV and some of the New Versions say, A man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Let me tell you something. You can kneel down and worship, but there's a, there's a difference between kneeling down and worshiping. It doesn't say... It doesn't say in the original Greek that the leper came and knelt down. It says he worshipped. It literally means worship. But the modern versions have changed that to knelt down. I've showed these verses to Jehovah's Witnesses, and they scoff at me and say, no, Jesus isn't supposed to be worshipped. He's not God. You can't worship Jesus. And I'll show them. Oh, no, that just means he knelt down. It doesn't mean he knelt down. It means he worship. Worship. Now, worship may include kneeling, in reverence and worship. But there's a difference between kneeling down and worship. Uh, here's some more. Here's some more now. Um, in Matthew 9, 18, it says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. But the modern versions say, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him. Matthew 15, 25, that's a famous story, the Syrophoenician woman, one of my favorite stories. She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But the modern versions say the woman came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. Mark 5, 6 says, but when he, that's the man with the unclean spirit, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Notice many, many verses which tell us that Jesus was worshipped. Why? Because he's God. Right. And we're supposed to worship God. Right. But the modern versions say when he saw it, Jesus, from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. So again, kneeling down could include worship. It doesn't have to mean worship. I mean, you can kneel down to fix the carpet. You can kneel down to tie your shoelaces. You can kneel down. So kneeling down could include worship. But the word should be translated, the proper word is worship. And these modern versions are trying to do way with worshiping Jesus. They're trying to diminish his deity. That's the problem. Now, other doctrinal words, good doctrinal words like repentance have been omitted from the modern versions. Now, again, a lot of people don't like repentance. A lot of preachers don't preach on repentance. People don't want to hear the word repentance. It goes against the grain. A lot of people that chafe at that. But I think we ought to keep preaching repentance, amen? And I think one of the reasons our country's in such bad shape is we've got a church, churches full of people who've never repented of their sin. That's the problem. Repentance has been taken out of the New Bibles. I'll give you an example. Matthew 9.13. Matthew 9.13, the King James says, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But the new versions take that out and just say, I've not come to call the righteous. That's it. But sinners. It doesn't say to repentance. They leave out to repentance. They take the word repentance out of that verse, changing the meaning of the verse, really. If you take that repentance, you change the whole meaning of the verse. All right? Here's another one. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Oh, they're taking the blood out of a lot of these new versions, too. And by the way, these liberal churches have even taken the blood out of the hymn books. Right. Oh, you're washing the blood, there's power in the blood. They've removed those hymns. They got, they've taken them out of the hymn books. They don't like to talk about the blood of Christ. Huh? Hey, beloved, we're saved by the blood of Christ. Amen? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But anyway, Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through, redemption through his blood, through his blood is left out of the New American Standard, the New International Version, these other modern versions. They're taken out through his blood. In Luke 4, 8, Jesus said to the devil, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
that's been taken out of all the new versions. That, that statement by Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan, it's, it's missing. It's not in the new Bibles at all. See? And what did, you, what did the Bible say? It's, it's, you can't, take any, can't add anything or take away anything from the Bible. But yet they do it all the time with these new versions. You won't find the word Calvary in the new versions. Calvary is missing. So we have a generation growing up with these new versions. What's Calvary? What, what does that mean, Calvary? They never heard that word. It's not, it's not in their Bible. So at least they can sing, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. No, not it was for me, he died on Calvary. No, they probably don't even know that because they've taken the old hymns out of the hymn books to <laughs> replace them with these stupid new pop type hymns, you know, the 7-Eleven, seven words 11 times to say it over and over, you know, the shallow little songs they sing in these contemporary churches and so on. All right, Here, you won't find Calvary in the new versions. You won't find propitiation. That's an important doctrinal word. You won't find Godhead. Many words. The word hell is found 54 times in the King James Version. That's pretty important, 54 times. That's why we preach hell, messages on hell, amen? Not because we enjoy it, we just don't want to see people go there, so we warn them about it. Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. In fact, Jesus preached more about hell than any other preacher in the Bible. And the word is found 54 times in the King James. Watch this, only 14 times in the New American, New, New International Version. 54 times in the King James, 14 times in a modern translation. The word sodomite and sodomites, oh, that's in the news a lot now, huh? <whistles> Unfortunately. Uh, the word sodomite and sodomites, of course, that means homosexuals, are found five times in the King James, but you're not going to find it even once in the NIV. Not even once. It's been taken out altogether. And uh, I did a little research on that, and I think I know what, what happened. Because one of the persons on the translation committee was a woman named Virginia Mullencott, and she's an admitted lesbian. They actually had a lesbian, a well-known lesbian, working on the translation of the New International Version. Maybe that's why they took the word sodomite out of the NIV. Hmm? Think about that. Let me conclude with a poem. I'm sure some of you have heard this. Maybe all of you have heard it. I think it's a nice poem. It's written by a man named John Clifford. It goes like this. By the way, it's called The Anvil of God's Word. Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil sing the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with blasting years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptic blows have beat upon, yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed and the hammers are gone. Heavenly Father, we're thankful we have a reliable, trustworthy English translation, one that we can have confidence in and preach from and learn from and teach from, use it to win others to Christ and so on. Thank God for the King James Version. Help us just to study it, to learn it, and to tell others why we believe it's the most accurate and trustworthy version and to warn others with the right spirit uh, to be gracious about it and patient with people, but to tell them that these other versions are not dependable and to warn them and try to get them off them and to get them into a more, a better translation. That is the King James Version. Thank you for the good meeting we had tonight. Keep your hand on, the, on our congregation. Keep your hand on our pastor. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Let's sing number 278. Rather, 277. 277, let's stand. every soul by sin. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him. I just want to say amen to Brother Barker. That's a good message. 
I wrote a little note in the little white pages in the back of your Bible. That's what they're there for, at least that's what I've always used them for. Um, by the time I, my Bibles wear out, they're usually filled. But I wrote a little note in there. It can't be pure if something's added. Can't be preserved if something's taken away. And I thought that was real good, so I'm going to hang on to that one. Uh, amen. So, all right, well, let's close in a word of prayer tonight. And uh, Evan, would you please lead us in prayer? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for your word you've given to us, Lord, and I, I thank you for the security it gives us. Amen. I pray that you would just uh, bless us all as we uh, go our separate ways, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, put someone in our path to uh, witness to the, the, this week. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless all those who are sick. We think of Brother Shrope and uh, my mom, Lord. I pray that you just heal them from their surgeries. And uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.